Good morning, students. Bio 102, finally, and lecture one. Uh, we are going to start with basic stuff, animal form and function. So we already studied Bio 101, and now we have graduated to 102, and we're going to look at some very simple concepts to build on uh, them and uh, to proceed in complexity. We're going to look at the challenges of life. In Bio 101, we actually defined what was life. We looked at um, how difficult it is actually to pinpoint a definition of life that is valid. And uh, we came up with something that was uh, that is the current definition of life as given uh, by latest research, and that was life is a chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution that resists entropy. And it was a mouthful, but we looked at it and we studied it and we understood it. And now we're going to look at what are the div what are the challenges for for or life and for all organisms, there is an enormous diversity in facing the same challenges of life. Um, the, all organs do, organisms do have to feed. Um, so there's diversity in how to feed. All organisms do have to fight off infection. And yes, while we don't really particularly care if a bacteria gets an infection, it is still an infection. And uh, there are many, many ways to fight it. And all organisms do have to reproduce because that is one of the basic parts of the definition of life. There are enormous levels of organization to face these pressures, and they have developed over millions of years of evolution. There are different anatomical and physiological methods to, to uh, face these challenges, and different ways to keep the internal environmental temperature constant, which is pretty important because, as we learned, uh, proteins denature and all life works on chemical reactions, uh, which are sped up by enzymes, which are actually proteins. So um, the temperature, the internal temperature, um, has to be kept constant. There are bounds and limits. And so we can't actually talk about life and just think that, well, you know, it could get really, really, really big or really, really, really small. There are limits. There are limits to what life can actually do. While it is very resilient, um, they have to fall, uh, these limits have to fall within the laws of physics that exist. Um, the diversity still has to fall within these bounds. Um, for instance, strength of muscles. You can't actually um, go out of bounds in developing the strength of a muscle. And there is a certain limit, and after that, it just won't work. Um, uh, the, you can't actually go faster. Movement can't, uh, there's a limit to where movement cannot go faster. Um, gravity, the gravity itself is, is a defined unit, so there's a limit for that. Um, there's, as we studied, diffusion is very slow, and there's a limit for that too. And heat exchange, there's many, many things that um, an organism has to do uh, while it's living, and they all fall into some limits of physics but they also have limits of chemistry. Um, bonds, we looked at bonds in 101. We looked at all kinds of bonds, like chemical bonds, covalent, polar covalent, um, ionic, and weak chemical bonds. And they all have limits because they have a certain amount of energy that is stored in those bonds. You cannot break all those bonds unless you get over the big activation barrier, the Gibbs free energy that we discussed. Um, so there are limits uh, to life that are imposed upon by chemistry and physics. And this is what we discussed in Bio 101 too, that while um, under, the life, uh, under the laws of physics and chemistry, there should be no life. But the laws of biology are superimposed on the laws of physics and chemistry, and um, they are uh, ways to get around those laws, um, but we can only do it temporarily because entropy must always increase. And so uh, an organism can only live for so long because um, he is going against against the laws of physics, um, which always will dominate in the end. 
So um, these uh, limits and boundary conditions impose um, limits on how big an organism can actually get. Um, or how small can an organism actually get? What is the minimum size before an organism can boot up? Um, and what is the maximum size? So in the Hollywood movies, we see things like, um, you know, great big apes or great big monsters, and they thunder around on the surface of the earth, and they're bigger than the Empire State Building. And well, actually, you know, that is um, is, is is a very fine imagination, but in reality, um, we can't actually get that big um, because of the laws of physics and chemistry. And we're going to look at those, um, and also the general form of living organisms um, that the a form that we acquire, which is mostly tubular. Um, and there's also a pattern of life. And so there are all kinds of limits and boundaries that are imposed upon uh, biology and living organisms by these laws of physics and chemistry. So we're going to look at body plans first, and we're going to look at what happens to body plans. Generally speaking, living forms assume a tubular shape. Um, and I have brought in a few examples, and you can look at them and you can say, well, okay, so we are pretty much tubular. Um, jellyfish, you can sort of say they're tubular, and maybe even a bear, pretty much tubular. Fishes are tubular looking. And um, all right, so here we come to trees. This part is definitely tubular, um, but the canopy is not. The canopy is uh, uh, an adaptation so that it can, the organism can obtain maximum sunshine to uh, produce food. Um, but generally speaking, when uh, the canopy is empty and the full leaves have fallen down, then it is indeed tubular. So um, plants and animals generally, no matter how complex or how simple they are, will assume a tubular shape because that is uh, a very good shape to be in. And why is that exactly? Because of the environmental pressures. They act on life forms and they make them assume this shape. The reason is the basic plan is to reduce the amount of energy expended and to try and maximize the energy received for the creature's growth. Generally speaking, um, body plans are either radial, which means they have symmetry in a radial direction like this, which would be this, or um, they have bilateral symmetry, which is us, because you can actually cut us down in the center. This side is exactly the same as this side. Or they can be totally asymmetrical. Um, and those would be very low forms of life, and they, uh, they would be um, asymmetrical. But generally speaking, um, most life forms assume a tubular shape, no matter how asymmetrical or, ra or symmetrical they are. Um, and they always try to have repeating units. Um, so in the radial symmetry, as you can see, every unit is just a re repetition of the other unit. Um, in bilateral symmetry, we have one half. Um, this half is being the same as the next half. And there's cephalization. So cephalic means head. So cephalization means there is um, a front and a back to the organization or organism. And so there's a head where most of the processes are being uh, controlled. And then uh, there is the rest of the body. So body plans generally try to reduce the surface area if the goal is to maximize speed, which means you would be actually using food. And that would be like in something who has to go fast to av avoid predators or to catch prey. Um, and body plans will generally increase surface area if the goal is to produce food. Refinements and adaptations evolve to allow every available energy niche to be used. So from these plans, we, we refine and uh, we adapt. And um, the reason is we want to maximize uh, the energy that we receive to make it useful for us to do work. 
So if you change the size of an object but keep its shape constant, something curious happens. Let's say, so this is just a thought exercise um, because you're thinking now, why do we have to be tubular? All right, um, so let's just look at it. Let's say that you increase the length by a factor of two. Areas are proportional to length squared, but the new length is twice the old length. So the new area is going to be proportional to the square of twice the old area. That is, the new area is not twice the old area, but actually four times the old area. So, and that just comes from the formula of area, because length is times length is, is area, right? So if you have two lengths, then two times two is four. So you're actually uh, not doubling it, but it's four times. So uh, when we look at this, and here is a picture of King Kong, you know, he's uh, looming over New York City, or um, I'm not sure which city that is. But um, what it's, it's showing is that the root of this problem of size limit lies in just simple geometry. If we scale up a square, what happens? So here's the square, and every side is one, one unit, let's say one inch. Well, we double it and double the size of it. So now every square side is two, okay? Um, this area now is just length times length. It becomes four times as much by doubling the length. So as the size changes, the volume change is faster than the area. And areas change faster than linear dimensions, okay? So what will happen is, and here's another example. So we looked at squares. Okay, so fine. Uh, you know, we can talk about squares. Um, the area of an object uh, in a, a square will be four times as much if we double it. Um, here is a rectangle. Okay, so we're let's assume that there's an organism that looks rectangular. All right. Well, here we go. Um, we double one side, uh, and then we double the entire organism. And uh, what do we get? Okay, so the ratio is again, this would be one is to four. Um, and here is a triangle. And so we have a triangle with sides uh, three, four, five, and the area of the triangle is six cubic units. Um, and we get one is to four again so um because we doubled it everything here is doubled so the four is doubled to eight the three is doubled to six the five is doubled to ten and so this triangle is double the size of the little one and again you would get the area of an object um being by just doubling the one side or a length of it it actually becomes four times. It doesn't double, it becomes four times. So geometry is going to restrain biology. And so therefore, when you look at organisms, so we have these insects called water striders, and they actually walk on water, which is kind of cool. If you look at them, they can just skim around on water. But what they need is long feet, not big feet, so that they can skate on the surface of a pond. So that's an example of how geometry is going to shape the organism's um, form. Uh, geckos, we looked at geckos in Bio 101 in weak chemical bonds. Well, geckos don't need long feet. They need broad, flat feet. And they're covered with millions of tiny little hairs, um, which produce those positive charges to walk on a ceiling or a wall. And a bird that flies into a window could actually break its neck. And you've seen this many times. Um, birds don't understand glass, and so they don't see it. Um, they think it's a clear area, and they slam right into it. And uh, the, the shock of that, uh, the force of that uh, collision will actually get them to, to um, be, at the very least, stunned. Um, uh, but most likely they will die because they will break its neck. Um, but a fly, who is much smaller, will fly into a window and it will just bounce right back without any in injury because why is that? So the collision is forces are 
are proportional to the volume. And so the inertial forces that we see in a collision, um, they are actually proportional to the volume of uh, the uh, uh, colliding object. And the forces produced by a muscle or the strength of a bone are also proportional to their cross-sectional areas. Okay, so the weight of the animal is therefore going to be, be proportional to its volume. So that's why King Kong is not a realistic uh, depiction. Here are the pictures uh, of uh, those organisms we just talked about. So notice the water strider's feet. They're long. Notice the gecko's feet. They're broad. These are each toes. And here is a picture of a bird flying into a window. He doesn't see it and he falls off um, and most likely dies. Whereas a fly flying into a window is just going to bounce off and it, it'll be fine. It'll fly, uh, fly off again. So there are limits on size also because not just geometry, but also because the exchange of nutrients and waste must be done for every single cell if the organism is multicellular, which a lot of um, UK, well, eukaryotes are mostly multicellular. If the organism is unicellular, there is really not much problem um, because the nutrients and waste simply diffuse in or out, but then again, uh, there's a limit of diffusion. However, um, it is not such a big problem. In multicellular organisms, however, they need dedicated organs for these functions. So they have to um, uh, organize their, their body parts um, and uh, allocate resources for just one organ, organ type to do one particular function for the entire organism. So the rate of exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen is proportional to the area. Oh, um, so this little symbol here means proportional, and I wrote it out because um, I, I won't most likely be writing it out again, but whenever I write that, that just means proportional. Um, so the rate of exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen, which is highly important to, to, uh, for metabolism, um, is proportional to the area, but the ex uh, whereas the amount of exchange of carbon dioxide and um, uh, oxygen is proportional to volume. So notice the rate of exchange is proportional to area, but the amount of exchange is proportional to volume. All right, let's see if I can erase. No, I can't erase, Never mind. Um, although the skin is the largest organ that any organism has, the internal surfaces are um, actually 25 times greater than the skin surface area. So you might think, what is she saying? Um, well, because the inside, um, all our organs are made out of skin and the organs are actually invaginated. So when you look at this, and if I opened this out, this would actually be a really long thread. If I took this and I traced it out and I traced it out over here, it would become a very, very long thread. So um, this would be, let's say, an alveoli. If you opened it up uh, and you stretched out the entire alveoli, it would be a very, very long piece of skin, whereas, uh, you know, um, it is enclosed inside a lung, and the lung is enclosed inside the chest cavity, and the chest cavity is enclosed inside us, and we aren't that big. So um, inside us, there's a whole lot of complexity, and uh, the, the uh, um, internal surfaces are a whole lot greater than the external surfaces. Also, um, there is the square cube law, which we should look at, and because there's an actual law which determines how big an organism can actually get. Um, and, and it depends on the rate at which oxygen is extracted from the air. Um, that is proportional to the surface area of the lungs. The rate at which food is digested and absorbed is proportional to the surface area of the gut. So again, proportional to the surface area. The rate at which heat is lost, so we're always losing heat because we need to keep our body temperature constant, is proportional to the surface area of the body. But the rate at which oxygen or food must be supplied or the rate at which the heat is produced 
is proportional to the mass, which is really the volume of the animal. And the square cube law describes the relationship between the volume and the area as a shape size increases. And this is something you most likely saw in lower grades um, in, in um, um, uh, math. Um, so this is a very old concept. It's uh, Galileo even talked about it in 1638. And he said the ratio of two volumes is greater than the ratio of their service. Well, that makes sense because he, he explained it. He said, I believe that a little dog might carry on its back two or three dogs of the same size. But I doubt if a horse could carry even one horse of its own size. So you can see right away the square cube law, the ratio of two volumes is greater than the ratio of their surface. So um, this is something that is very fundamental. And it um, manifests itself in um, muscle size. So the cross section of a muscle is only going to increase by the square of the square scaling factor, but the mass is going to increase by the cube. So that's why it's called a square cube law. For instance, um, let's say somebody is 60 feet tall or 60 inches tall. It doesn't really matter. Um, he's going to weigh, let's say he's 60 feet. He's going to weigh 1,000 times someone who's six feet because every square inch of a giant bone is going to have to support 10 times the weight. Yes? Okay. See? Six feet times 10 is 60 but he's actually going to have to support 1,000 times and the weight. Um, so that is enormous. So the bone is not going to be able to support a really, really, really big muscle. And the human thigh bone, which is the strongest bone in your body, will break under about 10 times the human weight. So, um, you know, if you say that you're six feet, 10 times... Uh, weight is going to actually make you 60 feet, your bones would break. So the thighs of a 60 foot uh, human would actually break every time they took a step. So that isn't going to work. So that is why there are limits on how big organisms can get. Um, and um, when we talk about flying monsters, uh, again, not just organisms that walk, but how why can't things that fly get bigger? Well, um, wings generate lift due to the motion of air over the wing surface. So that would be here, over the wing surface. So if this is a wing, this is where the lift is. Okay, larger wings move more air. So an animal with a large wing, relative to its mass, uh, it's also known as low wing loading, will have more lift available at any given speed, enabling it to take off and land at lower speeds and turn faster. Okay, so this, this is great. This is excellent. However, um, larger animals would have to fly faster to gain the same amount of lift. And so the, there is a limit. There's an upper critical limit for bird flight, and that's about five pounds per foot squ per, uh, square foot. So that's about 25 kilograms per meter square. And we see this every day. Again, um, something small like an ant is not seriously injured when you can drop him from even a, the top of the Empire State Building. He's not going to get smashed. He's just going to take a second and then calmly crawl off again. Because the air resistance per unit mass um, is higher for small animals. And so it's not going to really bother him. But um, the air resistance for large animals um, is going to be um, extremely, uh, it's, it's going to be a limit that we can't actually get over. So there's also the pressure of natural selection. And we looked at natural selection last uh, uh, in Bio 101, and we saw that natural selection is actually the survival of the fittest, and that ensures that only those offspring thrive that did better than the rest of their kind or that population in that set of environmental conditions. And so uh, since there's enormous diversity in a population, a tiny advantage can endow enormous gains on that organism. And similarly, a tiny disadvantage could lead to, 
to its early demise. So this really should be a 2. And it will be eliminated from the gene pool. Multicellularity will increase complex complexity, and we would understand that. Um, more detailed information uh, can be received by the, uh, by the organism of the environment. And once that organism has more information, because information is power, then that organism can control a lot of the release of its energy to create an internal stable environment. So um, multicellularity is a great thing because then we can actually get more information about the, the environment so we can uh, survive better. Uh, under changing conditions. So um, when we have a hierarch hierarchical organization, that results in new and emergent properties. So we can just have cells, and then uh, an aggregate of cells will make a tissue. Then uh, a bunch of tissues get, get together and make an organ. Um, and then you can have many organs that can get together and make an organ system. So successive levels of structural and functional organization arise in life forms, and these result in the emergence of organs and tissues. And cells, which are the basic unit of life, organization of cells results in tissues or groups of a type, for example, a muscle. And we looked at uh, muscle cell sarcomeres in 101 as well. Uh, different tissues get together to form an organ. So that would be, for instance, uh, for example, a heart. And several organs working together in concert for one goal, one goal, form a system like the digestive system. It could be the circulatory system. Um, it doesn't have to be just digestive. It could be circulatory. It could be nervous. It could be anything. But we have many systems, and they all are composed of many, many organs working together. So now we are going to look at some common systems, and we're going to actually explore a few and see um, what makes them unique and what are their functions. For instance, we have a digestive system. In the digestive system, we have many organs. So there is, uh, it starts out with the mouth, and then we have a pharynx, and then we have an esophagus, the stomach, and the intestines, and then there are sorted uh, helper organs called the liver and pancreas that are part of the digestive system. Um, the circulatory system consists of the heart, blood vessels, and blood. So that's a pretty simple one. The respiratory system actually just has the lungs, um, the trachea, and the alveoli. Um, and so that would look something like this. So here we have um, something over here. All right, so uh, we have trachea. Um, these are these are lungs, and inside the lungs are those tiny little bunches of, of grapes, which we also know as, know as alveoli. Um, the nervous system ha consists of uh, the brain, the spinal cord, nerves, sensory organs. So every system has a unique set of organs. And here are much better pictures than I can scribble, um, which show you the digestive system and all the details of it, and the circulatory system and all the details, uh, the nervous system and the details, the respiratory system and all kinds of details in there, and uh, the excretory system. Um, so these are all systems that are uh, inside a mammal. Um, and we're going to look at them step by step and one by one. But first, we need to find out what are these organs and systems made of. Actually, it's pretty simple. There are only four main tissue types. So all those organs that look very complex and very different from each other are actually made out of just four different tissue types. So tissue types can either be epithelial, connective, muscular, or nervous. And these are all cells that are modified in one way or another. And we're going to look at those modifications. So um, epithelial tissue, uh, first of all, uh, we need to know that uh, the tissue is going to reflect its function. And so the modifications of a cell are going to reflect that function. The primary function of an epithelial tissue is to protect the tissues that lie beneath it 
from radiation, from desiccation, desiccation means drying out, toxins, which are poisons, invasion by pathogens, and uh, any physical trauma. So protection is a primary function. So we can start thinking now, what would a tissue, what would a cell have to do or look like to protect uh, from all these different um, bad things? And uh, another primary function of epithelial tissue is to regulate the exchange of chemicals between the underlying tissues. Uh, and this regulation is very selective. It's selective or, or absorption, and uh, there's transcellular support, transport. So it's going to have to regulate that. It's going to have to say how much uh, can come in or go out. And uh, epithelial tissue is also um, going to be required to secrete hormones or secrete sweat, or mucus, or enzymes. So these are primary functions of epithelial tissues. And it also must, um, because it's the first barrier, it has to provide sensation. So um, you can see right away that there are a whole bunch of um, diversifications in, in this epithelial tissue. So there are three main types of epithelial cells. They can either look squamous, which is nice and squat, um, and flat, a columnar, which means looking like a column, or cuboidal, which means they look like a cube. And um, epithelial cells are responsible for protection, again, and detection of sensation, secretion, selective absorption, transcellular transport. Um, but the important thing is they actually don't contain blood vessels, and which means instead of saying no blood vessels, we should just use the term avascular. Um, so epithelial layers are avascular. So how are they supposed to live? Because they've got to receive food and they have to uh, get rid of uh, waste. So nourishment is actually received by diffusion from the underlying connective tissue. Um, the epithelial tissue, however, is innervated, which means it does have nerve cells or nerve sensation uh, is there. There's just no blood. And here are some pictures of a simple cuboidal. So here the cells are about the same, same height and width. Uh, simple squamous means they're wider than they are taller, so they're kind of flattened. And then simple columnar, they are taller rather than they're wider, so they're oriented this way. And then we can have stratified. Strata means layers. So uh, the layers can be different shapes. So you can have a squamous uh, epithelial layer like this, which could be just on top. But as you go deeper into the uh, epithelial layers, you can come up with cuboidal down here. Um, and it could actually be different. So uh, there is epithelial tissue, which uh, varies in, in shape only because uh, how, of the number of layers. So the simple epithelial cells, what are their functions? Um, squamous epithelial cells, well, uh, they line areas of passive diffusion. So because they're flattened, you would find them in the walls of capillaries, or you would find them in the alveoli, or uh, in the walls of the lungs. The cuboidal epithelium, then they're nice and cube-shaped. They usually have um, a secretory function or an absorptive function or an excretory function. Um, it, they could be in the small collecting ducts of uh, the kidneys or the pancreas, or they could be in the salivary glands. So um, in the salivary salivary glands, they would be actually doing secretory stuff. Um, a columnar epithelium is very highly secretory, as in the wall of the stomach. So because they're very, very tall, they can actually uh, have a lot of stuff in them. and um, Or they can absorb a lot of stuff uh, if they're inside the small intestine. And usually, columnar epithelial cells um, extend out in microvilli, as we will see inside the stomach. So the stratified epithelial cells, what do they look like? So remember, stratified means layers or strata. So many layers um, of cells can, epithelial cells can, you can have a, a, a mixture. You can be all squamous or cuboidal or columnar or a mix. 
And you need many layers of epithelial, epithelium because this is used in areas of high stress and insult like the skin so or, or any organ that gets distended or stretched like the stomach you put food in uh, it has to distend itself so there that's there's a pressure or stress associated with that cell so it can't rupture um, when the food goes away then it has to squash back down so um, these have to change and so there's got to be a lot of layers otherwise um, you will end up with a hole so um, some cells will die uh, fall off but there will still be other layers behind it you can also have pseudo stratified epithelium which is known as the respiratory epithelium which lines the airways of your nose your trachea and bronchi and notice um, it is actually just the one layer but if you notice um, they, they get uh, different shapes the nuclei move up and down and they have uh, these little extensions on the top which look like hair um, but they're actually finger like villi so um, this is where the epithelial tissue can be found in an, in an organism and uh, these are all those uh, types of epithelium that we just discussed and as you can see um, it uh, depicts where is the cuboidal the columnar the squamous and so on um, in an animal next is the connective tissue um, this by its name it connects so it's it's just something that connects these are cells that connect one type with another type of tissue they're found in between other tissues everywhere in the body uh, their function is to support or to connect or separate different types of tissues and organs in the body connective tissue also includes brown and white adipose tissue which is brown and white fat you may have heard of brown fat um, but usually when you see fat it's all white connective tissue interestingly enough is also blood and I know blood is not like a tissue and it's it's a liquid but uh, it is a connective tissue because it connects right it's a form of connection um, cartilage is connective tissue bone is connective tissue um, and most immune system cells uh, they are um, like macrophages mast cells eosinophils they're scattered inside the loose connective tissue and they are kept there to start the immune response right away what is the function of connective tissue all connective tissue has three main components so it can be either fibrous um, it can be elastic or more co collagenous or it can be called ground substance which means it's kind of amorphous and we can't really tell what it is and uh, or it could actually have the form of a cell like a fibroblast or a macrophage or a leukocyte or an adipocyte or it, it actually has a real definite defined shape uh, not like ground substance fibroblasts and fibers like elastin allow organs to resist stretching and uh, to resist tearing and they form loose irregular connective tissue so this is a good thing because you don't want your organs to you know constantly be under repair uh, because of something that happened and that was small dense regular connective tissue forms organized structures like tendons and ligaments so um, these, these are very interesting ways that uh, cells can actually help us and here is a picture showing all those talks uh, those types of cells that we just looked at talked about um, but now we have a depiction so here is a fibrous connective tissue uh, notice that this is um, so we have uh, these are actually nuclei and the rest of it is kind of wavy looking um, this is collagen notice how it doesn't really have a defined structure some cells can be like this some cells can be like this um, so collagen is is different bone is pretty well defined um, and uh, you have actually you still have um, nuclei and stuff like that and then you have of course red blood cells in inside the blood um, fat droplets so notice this this is one cell 
and it's got all these little droplets, these little droplets of fat inside. So this is an adipose tissue cell. The next type of tissue is muscular tissue. There are three types of muscular tissue, uh, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. Um, so skeletal muscles are those that are voluntary. So you actually can control them or the organism can control them, whereas the smooth and the cardiac muscles are involuntary and the organism has no control over them. Um, they are just automatic. Skeletal muscles are striated and are used for locomotion, and they usually make up about 40% of us. So um, these are all skeletal muscles, and you can see that they're striated, so you know they have striations. And uh, these are the nuclei in between. Um, and they're tubular cells. And there are many nuclei per cell, and this is an a this is not a, uh, this is an actual picture of a muscle, not a cartoon version as I just uh, drew over. So smooth muscles are found within the walls of digestive system, the respiratory system, the circulatory system, the excretory system, reproductive system, any system that we cannot control. And um, these muscle cells are actually very different. They're spindle shaped. They only have one nucleus per cell. And you can see the cartoon picture on the left and an actual picture on the right, which shows you um, pictures of smooth muscle cells. The cardiac muscle is only found in the heart. And this is very different um, because it has intercalated calcium discs. So um, what you see, these intercalated um, discs are actually made out of calcium. They're in, interspersed between um, the cells and they branch off each other. So the cells are branching off each other. You can see a nucleus here, and there's a nucleus here, then there's an intercalated disc here. And, and um, this muscle is self-contracting and it is autonomically regulated. Um, why is that? We cannot control it because your heart has to beat about 100,000 times a day, which means about 35 million times a year or about 2.5 billion times in your life, assuming you live about 70 or 80. So, um, and, and that comes from the simple calculation that your heart beats 72 times a minute. All right, so uh, you cannot actually control this, and so this is why it is um, self-regulating. Here is a picture of where all these muscle tissues are and these muscle cells in uh, any organism. And then we come to the last part, which is nervous tissue. So nervous tissue is made up of neurons and neuroglia. Neurons are um, nerve cells, which very large cell bodies, and they have one axon or protrusion or a foot. Um, and many smaller um, dendrites or hair-like protrusions around their sides. Uh, neurons are very specialized cells because they take electrochemical signals and they transmit them down their axons to the next neuron by changing the voltage inside the cell. So isn't that clever? So here is uh, the picture of a neuron, and here is the neuron cell body. That's the nucleus. Um, here is its foot or its axon. And um, these little guys are all extensions of the main cell, um, and they are used for communication with the adjoining neuron. So the neuron that is next door to it. Um, so they talk to each other through these little extensions. Uh, a neuroglia looks similar to an, uh, a neuron, except as you notice, it does not have a foot or one extra long um, axon. That is because their function is to support and to nourish the neuron itself because the neuron is very important. Um, the neuroglia uh, not so important, it's, it's got a secondary role. It's supposed to just support the main guy, which is the neuron itself. Neurons can be sensory, uh, which means uh, they are afferent, afferent. Notice the A. Um, afferent means they take the signal from the sense organ to the brain, okay? Um, neurons can also be motor. And at that point, they're called efferent, because they take the signal from the brain to the muscle. So um, first you have to have a signal, 
and that is picked up by a sensory neuron and the sensory neuron will take that signal take it to the brain the brain will understand it and then it will activate a motor neuron and say move or whatever the action is is uh, supposed to be so um, these are the two main types of neurons there are also interneurons and they just connect um, neurons inside the brain they're they're there um, to because one neuron can only sometimes it's not that long sometimes it is and if you have interneurons they're just connecting neurons just like if you had um, let's say extension cords the function of uh, the nervous tissue is information processing and I actually have um, a, a YouTube um, video which I thought might be very nice for us to watch